Thank, thank you, Tom. Uh, great to be here. Uh, great to be back in Australia with uh, old friends from The Spectator and, uh, and from the IPA uh, and, uh, and with uh, uh, John Howard. I, uh, I regret the, uh, the, the changes. While it's nice to be with so many old friends, I regret uh, that some of the political changes that have taken place since I was last here. I was at a wonderful dinner that John organized with uh, Tony Abbott and Dan Hannon and a lot of people on Saturday. And I was sitting next to a lady and she said, ask me where I'd come in from. And I said, I'd flown in from Vancouver. And she said, oh, uh, oh I uh, flew in from Vancouver too. The, the last time I flew in, I got terrible food poisoning. And I said, oh, that sounds terrible. And she goes, uh, yes, I was thinking of going to hospital, but in the end I decided to ride it out and uh, just wait until all the vomiting and diarrhea had passed. And uh, I said, that's how I feel about the Labour leadership contest. Uh, so, so, it was, uh, so, so it's, great, it's great to be back. I saw, I saw a, t a tweet, by the way, the other, uh, the other day from an Australian called Damon, who seems to be enjoying my tour so far. Uh, he, he wrote, quote, I now subconsciously mute the TV whenever Mark Stein appears, unquote, uh, which I wouldn't have minded, but I, I, I've actually only appeared on one TV show uh, <laughs> since I got here. I, I'm, I, I think I'm going to up the, I'm going to double it. I'm, I'm supposed to be on Q&A next <laughs> Monday, <laughs> which Janet knows very well. I'm going to be on with, uh, with Jeffrey Rush, the actor. <laughs> I, I loved him in the, uh, in the King's Speech, uh, which most of you probably know, the, uh, the painful, uh, harrowing, emotionally draining story of how he taught uh, George VI how to speak in public without stammering. Um, and I believe he's now doing a sequel, which is the painful, harrowing, emotionally draining story of how he taught Kevin Rudd how to speak in public without effing. It's a <laughs> it's, uh, it's surefire Oscar bait. Uh, here, here's my problem. I've, 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 no, I've no problem with Damon subconsciously muting his TV when I'm on. I have a problem when too many people in Australia and in Britain and Canada and Europe wish to use the power of the state to silence those with whom they disagree. Uh, we, we just heard from Tom uh, uh, about those famous words of Voltaire. Uh, which the left ha has modified uh, significantly. I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death my right to get you banned from saying it. Uh, it it's one thing to wish, like Damon, to live in a kind of psychological one-party state. It's quite another thing uh, when you actually get the courts and the broader climate uh, of opinion to shrivel the bounds of public discourse at precisely the time we need to widen them. Uh, so our lesson for today comes from uh, Edward Gray, the British Foreign Secretary a century ago. On August 3rd, 1914, on the eve of the Great War, Sir Edward stood at the window of his office in the summer dusk, watched the London lamplighters going about their daily duty of lighting the gas lights, and he observed the lamps are going out all over Europe. T today, the lamps are going out on liberty all over the Western world in a more subtle and elusive and profound way. And I'm here tonight uh, because I want to relight those lamps. We are less free than our grandparents in almost every particular, not least property rights. Every aspect of our lives is increasingly micro-regulated. The government is in our trash cans, in our light sockets, in our toilets. Uh, the one exception to the trend is that we have more sexual freedom than we used to. You're free to get it on with whoever you like, whatever you like, in whatever permutation you like, uh, because these days sexual license is about the only thing you don't need a license for. Um, when you get beyond that distraction, the withering of liberty is real. And one reason we don't notice it uh, as much as we should is because increasingly we're not free to talk about it. So aside from uh, Edward Gray, I would also like to cite the words of Salman Rushdie speaking at Columbia University. Quote, free speech is the whole thing, the whole ball game. Free speech is life itself. He said those words 20 years ago in the early days of the Ayatollah Khomeini's fatwa against him for the crime of writing a novel, a work of imagination. And the Ayatollah's mob contract is still in force. 
uh, just a few weeks ago, Sir Salman canceled an appearance at a literary festival in India uh, when a plot to assassinate him at the festival was uncovered. All that has changed over those two decades is that where once in the late 1980s he could count on the full-throated support of the government and of public opinion and of his fellow uh, artists, today the government uh, and many others uh, around the Western world uh, are far more muted in their support of his right to say what they want. And artists in particular, artists in particular are pathetic on this issue. The, this is a group of people who congratulate themselves far more than soldiers and firemen do on their courage. And yet all these brave, <laughs> courageous artists are silent uh, at the shriveling of free speech around the West today. Uh, Like Andrew Bolt, I stand before you guilty of crimes against humanity. I always think that looks good on a chap's resume. <laughs> and you'd be surprised how much work it brings in, too. Um, and like Andrew, I beat the rap. Uh, McLean's magazine and I were acquitted of, quote, flagrant Islamophobia uh, for essentially political reasons. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure in what way flagrant Islamophobia is worse than just regular Islamophobia. <laughs> I think it's an extra 10 to 15 years. I'm not quite sure what it, uh, what it was. But, but neither the British Columbia Court nor its travesty of a human rights code could withstand the heat of a guilty verdict, and so I was acquitted. So I didn't seek this fight. Um, but during the early skirmishes, a colleague who's also been called up before one of these human rights star chambers uh, mused in an email about the difference between his own instincts and his uh, high-priced lawyer's advice that he should be, quote, reasonable in order to, quote, get off the hook. And the economist uh, printed my response to him, quote, I don't want to get off the hook. I want to take the hook and stick it up the thought police's collective butt. <laughs> and then I want to give it a twist. <laughs> when a... <clears throat> When a, when a state apparatchik says you can't say something, that's all the more reason to say it again and say it even louder. Because you're not the issue, they're the issue. That was my advice to Andrew Bolt. That was my attitude with the British Columbia Human Rights uh, Tribunal. Uh, under their travesty of a human rights code, I'm guilty. Uh, because uh, the right not to be offended is now the greatest human right throughout the Western world. And the statutory penalty for my crime would have been a lifetime publication ban in British Columbia and de facto in the rest of Canada. Because I wrote a book, uh, which, as Tom pointed out, was actually a best-selling book. In Canada, it was a number one bestseller. So the state is presuming to criminalize not just my writing, uh, but the reading habits of mainstream Canadians. It's the same with Andrew Bolt. He's not the fringe. He's Australia's most read columnist. And so the state is presuming to criminalize not just Andrew's opinions, but those of thousands and thousands of Australians too, including all of you here tonight. The court is effectively saying your tastes are also criminal. Uh, as I say, uh, Andrew Bolt's not the fringe, uh, but let me start out on the wilder shores because that's where all these crazy laws start. Um, some of you may be familiar with a fellow called David Icke, a former Coventry City goalie and a BBC sports presenter. I shared a, a BBC telly sofa with him once long ago. Uh, anyway, David had a bit of a turn one day, and he called a press conference to announce he was the son of God. And shortly, shortly thereafter, he concocted a grand... Cons he doesn't do as much sports presentation on the BBC <laughs> as he used to. Don't look for him at the 2012 Olympic coverage. Um, Shortly thereafter, he concocted a grand conspiracy theory to explain everything that happens anywhere in the world. David believes in a secret world government run by pedophile Satanist Illuminati, controlled by the Queen and the Bush family, who are, he says, reptilian humanoids descended from the blood-drinking space lizards of the star system Alpha Draconis. Uh, he claims that the late Princess of Wales confirmed to him that the royal family are shape-shifting space reptiles shortly before her mysterious death. Um, 
he wrote in 2001 that the dear old Queen Mum was, quote, seriously reptilian. They've got to her, too. Um, and if you're thinking, well, look, okay, if I, if I steer clear of Diamond Jubilee events, I'm unlikely to run into any shape-shifting space lizards. It's not just the House of Windsor. All 44 American presidents have apparently been space lizards. Uh, as, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure about Australian prime ministers. I don't want to start a panic uh, in the room or anything. Um, uh, as was, uh, but there's a lot of it about. Apart, apart from the, uh, the, the Queen and the uh, presidents, uh, space lizards, prominent space lizards include Bob Hope, Lady Gaga, and the country singers Chris Christopherson and Boxcar Willie. Any, uh, any Boxcar Willie fans here tonight? Thank goodness for that. Uh, now look, Her Majesty the Queen has never filed a libel suit against David Icke. As far as I know, she responds to allegations that she's a blood-drinking, shape-shifting space lizard uh, by laughing the, the socks off her sinister reptilian feet about it. Um, so instead, a man called Richard Warman, Canada's hate finder general, filed suit on Her Majesty's behalf, taking David Icke to court on the following grounds. Quote, he has taken all the conspiracy theories that have ever existed and melded them together to create an even greater conspiracy theory of his own. What benefit can there be in allowing him to speak, unquote? What benefit can there be in allowing him to speak? A longtime human rights bureaucrat thinks that it's the state's role to, quote, allow citizens to speak if they can demonstrate some, quote, benefit in doing so. Uh, with human rights like that, who needs lack of human rights? We'd, we didn't notice this at first because the human rights establishment was just shutting up neo-Nazis who don't like Jews and fundamentalist Christians who disapprove of gay marriage and whiling away the idle moments in between by chastising a few kooks who think the royal family are giant space lizards. But if you give the state extraordinary powers, they always start at the fringes of society and they always move inward. We all know the famous words of Pastor Martin Niemöller. First they came for the communists and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the guys who think the queen is a vampiric shapeshifter from Alpha Draconis. <laughs> And I didn't speak out because I suddenly noticed the Prince of Wales and Lady Gaga had pounced on my nine-year-old and were drinking his blood. <laughs> David Icke is a weirdo, but the hack bureaucrat who thinks that the state has the jurisdiction to, quote, allow citizens to speak is a far bigger weirdo, and he's a weirdo with government power. I would rather take my chances with a shape-shifting space lizard than an endlessly morphing, ever-expanding star chamber that shames some of the oldest, freest societies on the planet. The assumptions underpinning that question, what benefit is there in the state allowing you to speak, have advanced dramatically, from neo-Nazi losers in their parents' basements, to conspiracy theorist gurus, to Canada's leading Newsweekly, to the leader of a major Dutch political party, to Australia's most read columnist. In such a world, how many more of us will discover the state can find no, quote, benefit in allowing us to speak? Uh, the response of the European Union Commissioner for Justice, Freedom and Security to the Danish cartoons crisis a couple of years ago was to propose a press charter that would oblige newspapers to exercise, quote, prudence on certain controversial subjects. The response of Tony Blair's ministry to the problems of his own restive Muslim populations was to propose a sweeping law dramatically constraining free discussion of religion. The French writer Michel Houellebecq was taken to court for the opinions of a fictional character in his novel. Now America, uh, for the most part, is, is still different. It has the First Amendment. Uh, around the time the Canadian Human Rights Commission began investigating my writing, the US Senator Larry Craig had an unfortunate run-in with uh, the undercover cop in the adjoining stall of the Minneapolis airport men's room. Uh, Senator Craig was arrested for sliding his foot under the stall divider and twirling it in a George Michael-like manner. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
And I was amazed to read in the newspaper a story announcing that Senator Craig's lawyer had filed a brief arguing that the foot gestures he supposedly made under the bathroom stall divider were constitutionally protected speech under the First Amendment. <laughs> what a fabulous country. In Canada, according to the Canadian Islamic Congress, freedom of speech doesn't extend to my book. In Australia, according to the courts, freedom of speech doesn't extend to the Herald Sun. But in America, Senator Craig's men's room semaphore is covered by the First Amendment. <laughs> Uh, from now on, uh, you know, uh, my advice to anyone is don't write about radical Islam, just hit on imams in bathrooms, it's a lot safer. Uh, so three cheers, three cheers for the First Amendment, but in practice, for anything but uh, public bathroom foot courtships, in practice, the shriveling of free speech in the rest of the West has led to self-censorship in America too, to the point where a book on the Danish cartoons published by the Yale University Press arguing that the controversy over the cartoons had been widely overstated, did not even dare to show them. Even in America, free speech is retreating into preemptive surrender. Uh, the weirdest aspect of that case for me was the day they devoted to discussing uh, my jokes, not whether, merely whether my jokes were lame, but whether they were in fact illegal and against the law. Uh, and, in, and indeed, whether my, they flew in expert witnesses from Philadelphia and Toronto to discuss whether my tone was not merely in, inappropriate but criminal. This is 21st century Canada, where it's apparently entirely normal for judges to preside over trials of jokes. Uh, immediately after wrapping up their inquisition of my gags, the genius jurists in, in British Columbia announced that for their next show trial, they would be pro prosecuting a Toronto stand-up comic. He appeared at a late-night comedy club, and he was berated by two drunken hecklers whom he silenced with some brusque put-downs. Unfortunately for him, the hecklers were lesbians who subsequently sued because he deprived them of their human right to heckle lesbianically. Uh, <clears throat> question. How many lesbians does it take to change a light bulb? Answer, that's not funny, but it is actionable. <laughs> Guy Earl, the comic, was convicted and fined $15,000. How many statist apparatchiks does it take to turn out the lights on core Western liberties? Far fewer than you think. Old, settled, democratic societies do not prosecute jokes. Uh, some of you may remember a fellow called uh, the Reverend Canaan Banana. In 1980, he became the first president of post-independence Zimbabwe. And uh, I remember at the time, it, it was said to be a little parting jest by the British to set up the first literal banana republic. Um, anyway, folks in Zimbabwe also found it a pretty funny name, so Parliament passed an act making it illegal to make jokes about his name. Uh, it didn't do him much good. A few years later, it emerged that the Reverend Banana had seduced his bodyguards, his chef, <coughs> his gardener, several policemen and Air Force officers, and most of the players on the Zimbabwe government football team. And poor old Kane and Banana found himself on trial for sodomy. As it happens, I met his wife uh, years later in a chip shop in the east end of London, of all places. I don't know, apparently that's where the uh, Zimbabwean Police Witness Protection Program resettled. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, anyway, by that point, the law forbidding jokes about the presidential name couldn't help him. Who needs gags when you've got headlines like, uh, Banana Forced Officer to Have Sex? <laughs> that, that's from The Guardian and banana appeals against sodomy conviction. <laughs> That's the BBC. And my personal favorite from the London Daily Telegraph, after President Banana fled to South Africa, quote, hand over banana, Mandela told. <laughs> but that's the point, you know. It's places like Robert Mugabe's Zimbabwe that criminalize jokes. Mm. And there's something very wrong when Canada and Australia and Western Europe suddenly find themselves tiptoeing down the same path. Uh, the, one of the greatest novels ever written about totalitarianism is Milan Kundera's first novel, The Joke, about a man whose life is destroyed in the early days of communist Czechoslovakia by an ill-advised joke. Uh, and anyone who reads that book 
understands that uh, initially are attract is attracted by the absurdity of the plot, but eventually comes to understand that it gets to the heart of the touchiness and insecurity of totalitarianism, that they cannot stand a joke. What is wrong with us today that our societies are so insecure uh, and so touchy that we now prosecute jokes? Uh, Lars Hedegaard, uh, Andrew Bolt, whatever one feels about that judgment, at least made it in the public prints uh, in a newspaper column. Uh, it, it's a very fine line between prosecuting Andrew Bolt and then going on from that to actually attempting to police the private opinions of people. Lars Hedegaard in Denmark was tried, acquitted, and then retried, convicted, and fined 5,000 kroner for some remarks about Islam's treatment of women made in his own home and, as he thought, in private, but taped and released to the world. Uh, tried, acquitted, retried, convicted, and fined 5,000 kroners uh, for a conversation, a private conversation in his own home. The Reverend Stephen Boysoin was convicted of the heinous crime of writing a homophobic letter to his local newspaper and was sentenced by the uh, uh, aggressive social engineer who serves as Alberta's human rights commissar to a lifetime prohibition on uttering anything, quote, disparaging about homosexuality ever again, in sermons, in newspapers, on radio, or in private emails and letters. Note that legal concept, not illegal or hateful, but merely disparaging. Dale McAlpine, a practicing Christian, was handing out leaflets in the English town of Workington and chit-chatting with shoppers when he was arrested on a public order charge by Constable Adams, the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender community outreach officer. <laughs> Mr. McAlpine had been overheard by the officer to observe that homosexuality is a sin. I'm gay, said Constable Adams. Well, it's still a sin, said Mr. McAlpine. So Constable Adams arrested him for causing distress to Constable Adams. Even under the insane CCTV-monitored postmodern hell of contemporary Britain, where everything is policed except crime, getting arrested, <laughs> getting arrested by the gay outreach officer for the crime of causing emotional distress to the gay outreach officer is far weirder than David Icke and his space lizards. No member of the public actually complained, but as Constable Adams pointed out, Mr. McAlpine was talking, quote, in a loud voice that might theoretically have been overheard by others, and we can't have that, can we? So he was fingerprinted, DNA sampled, and tossed in the cells for seven hours. You know, when I, when I was a lad, the old joke about the public toilets at Piccadilly Circus was that one should never make eye contact with anyone in there because the place was crawling with laughably unconvincing undercover policemen in white polar necks with policemen's boots sticking out from underneath their tight leather trousers, uh, just itching to arrest you for soliciting gay sex. Now they're itching to arrest you for not soliciting it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, and, 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 and don't, you don't have to worry about Constable Adams being around. It might just be a co-worker or even a co-playmate. 14-year-old Cody Stott asked her teacher at Harrop Fold High Street if she could sit with another group to do her science project, as in hers, the other five girls all spoke Urdu, and she didn't understand what they were saying. The teacher called the police, who took her to the station, photographed her, fingerprinted her, took DNA samples, removed her jewelry and shoelaces, put her in a cell for three and a half hours, and questioned her on suspicion of committing a Section 5 racial public order offense. An allegation of a serious nature was made concerning a racially motivated remark, declared the headmaster, Anthony Edkins. The school would not stand for racism in any form. In a statement, Greater Manchester Police said they took hate crime very seriously and their treatment of 14-year-old Cody was in line with normal procedure. Indeed it was, and that's the problem. And you don't even have to wait until high school. The government-funded National Children's Bureau in Britain has urged nursery teachers and daycare supervisors to record and report every racist utterance of toddlers as young as three. Now you're thinking, wow, 
the British education system must be going gangbusters if three-year-olds are capable of coherent racist statements. <laughs> what are these? Well, for example, if children, quote, react negatively to a culinary tradition other than their own by saying yuck, that could be a clear sign that they're incipient racists. Yuck, yuck. That's one monosyllable. That's three letters. <laughs> That's one letter less than, uh, what's that? Uh, no, it's the same number of letters as, what's that Australian shampoo, muck? Is that right? Is your, the, the one, the, the Australian shampoo muck, if your hair, yeah, M-U-K, that's it. So this is the same, Y-U-K, three letters, one syllable, a hate crime, a racial hate crime. Um, this isn't just nuts, it's actually profoundly wicked. It's actually evil. <clears throat> the Constitutional Council in France today has just struck down uh, a, uh, a hate speech law criminalizing denial of the Armenian genocide. Uh, President Sarkozy immediately announced uh, that his government would be redrafting that law uh, with a view to reimposing it. And, and Monsieur le Président gave a statement saying that he took genocide very seriously and he was <clears throat> not prepared to let this law go. I take genocide seriously. I do not take laws criminalizing genocide seriously. I think if a, a man is foolish enough to deny the Holocaust, uh, he should be reviled and he should be mocked and he should be jeered at and he should be humiliated. All the things that are in fact forbidden for Andrew Bolt to do under Australia's race laws. We actually need more of what he was convicted of. We actually need more humiliation and more mockery. Uh, and instead, uh, President Sarkozy is presuming uh, to put even more conversational topics off limit. Uh, when you accept that the state has the right to criminalize genocide uh, denial, you're conceding an awful lot. Uh, you're, you're accepting, apart from anything else, that the state, in ruling one opinion, first Holocaust den denial, and then another opinion, Armenian genocide uh, denial, out of bounds, that the that the state will be to content to stop there. As is now clear, it isn't. Restrictions on freedom of speech undermine the foundations of justice, including the bedrock principle of equality before the law. Uh, on Saturday, Mohammed Ansar of the Muslim Council of Britain tweeted that the rise of Islam in the West was now beyond reversal. And when some complacent secular ninny queried this, Mr. Ansar tweeted back, check the birth rates. Uh, by the way, I like the hashtags on this Twitter thread. The secular lefty who queried whether Islam would dominate used the hashtag, it's not a competition. When Mohammed told him to go back and check the birth rates, he used the hashtag, it's never a competition to the guy coming last, which I thought was like pretty, pretty cute uh, for, an, uh, for, for a triumphalist. Uh, anyway, somebody uh, then tweeted back to warn Mohammed Ansar that Mark Stein had been hauled into court for saying the very same thing about Muslim birth rates, so he better be careful. And he's right, I did. I quoted the Vienna Institute of Demography uh, that predicted by 2050 a majority of Austrians under the age of 15 will be Muslim. Uh, this is a country that uh, just a generation or two back was 90% Catholic. I mean, that's a pretty rapid transformation. Uh, Salzburg... 1938, uh, singing nuns, Julie Andrews, how do you solve a problem like Maria? Salzburg, 2038, uh, how do you solve a problem like Sharia? That's in one century. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, so I said that and I wound up, I wound up in court. But we all know Mohammed Ansar doesn't have to worry about that. Uh, when I, when I uh, discuss Muslim birth rights, birth rights, it's a hate crime. When a guy from the Muslim Council of Britain makes the same argument, it's just part of the rich, vibrant tapestry of diversity. Same words, but he can say them, I can't. One of the great strengths of common law has been its general antipathy toward group rights. Because the ultimate minority, the minority that matters, is the individual. The minute you have collective rights, you require dramatically enhanced state power to mediate the hierarchy of different victim groups. 
And in a world of Islamophobic gays, homophobic Muslims, and white blacks, it's tempting to assume the whole racket will collapse under the weight of its own absurdity. But it won't, because the law bends to those who mean it the most. Uh, in 2007, Tony Blair's ministry passed a law, in effect, requiring elementary schools to teach kindergartners and other youngsters all about the joys of same-sex marriage. You know the kind of books. Heather has two mommies, King and King, in which a handsome prince goes looking for a bride, meets three lovely princesses, but eventually marries one of the princess's brothers, and they reign happily over their magic fairy kingdom together. Now, when evangelical Christians object to these books, they're told, you, you Squaresville cats need to get with the big daddy-o, because we ain't changing anything. Uh, you've just got to accept that this is the way it is. In Bristol, England, when the Muslim parents at the primary school objected to these books, the city council caved in nothing flat and yanked them from the school. Uh, it's an interesting lesson, not just in the internal contradictions of multiculturalism, but on which side is likely to win. Uh, if it's a choice between Heather has two mommies or Heather has two imams, bet on Heather has two imams. Or, Heather has four mommies and a big bearded daddy who wants to marry her <laughs> off to her cousin from back in Pakistan. You know, this is, and, and we all know, we all know why they pulled them from the shelves uh, because of the nature of the complainants. At precisely a time when we are, ought to be encouraging broader, freer speech uh, Western governments are actually incentivizing uh, groups who threaten violence and are known to threaten violence. Nothing good, nothing good can come of that. I've had enough of hack officials telling me what I can say on matters large and small. I don't want a world where the state tells you what you can write, what you can sing, what you can joke, what you can think. Uh, the lofty idea of the war on racism is gradually turning into a hideously false ideology, the French philosopher Alain Finkelkraut said in 2005. And this anti-racism will be for the 21st century what communism was for the 20th century, a source of violence, unquote. Just so. Let us accept for the sake of argument that racism is bad, that homophobia is bad, that Islamophobia is bad, that offensive utterances are bad, that mean-spirited thoughts are bad. So what? As bad as they are, the government criminalizing all of them and setting up an enforcement regime in the interests of micro-regulating us into compliance is a thousand times worse. As John Milton wrote in 1644, give me the liberty to know to utter and to argue freely according to conscience above all liberties. Or as an ordinary citizen said to me after I testified on behalf of free speech to the Ontario Parliament at Queen's Park, give me the right to free speech and I will use it to claim all my other rights. Conversely, if you let them take the right to free speech, how are you going to stop them taking all the others? We are on the brink of historic geopolitical changes. Much of the Western world is insolvent. Uh, countries like Greece are sliding off the cliff. If ever there were a time to expand the bounds of public discourse, this is the moment. Yet instead, we are shuffling into a psychological bondage of our own making. Uh, Andrew Bolt's views on aboriginals, mine on Muslims, the Canadian nightclub comics on lesbians, uh, the 14-year-old schoolgirls on Urdu speakers, none of that is in the dock. What is at issue is the state and a big chunk of the establishment in the Western world, uh, its eagerness and willingness to silence opinions of which it does not approve. We have lost so much already. Uh, the plays we will never see, the books we will never read, the movies that will never be made. And to reprise Edward Gray one last time, when it comes to free speech, the lamps are going out all over the world. One distributor, one publisher, one silenced novelist, one cartoonist in hiding, one murdered film director, one sued newspaper columnist at a time. It's time to stop it, to reverse it, and to relight the lamps of liberty. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>